Good morning everyone and welcome to Forex Baptist Church. We're so glad you're able to join us this morning to worship together across our church. Before we begin our service, there's just a few notices. If you're watching live, then this evening, this Sunday evening at eight o'clock is our communion service. And this is just a chance to get together, to sing some worship songs and to take communion across our church family. This service will be taking place on Zoom and through unusual Zoom details available in the comments of the Facebook video, but it will also be streamed across YouTube. So we invite you to join us for our communion service Sunday evening at eight o'clock. The second notice is about our Alpha course, which has begun on Wednesday evenings at eight o'clock, but it's not too late to join. If it's something that you would like to be involved in, please get in touch for more information and to find out what it involves. The Alpha course takes place on Wednesday evenings on Zoom at eight o'clock. So we invite you to come along if you think that would be for you. And finally, another notice about our church members meeting on Thursday, the 25th of February at eight o'clock. Um, this is an advance notice and more information about what the agenda will be will be available to our church members very soon. So before we start our service, we invite you to move into a time of quiet. And this is something that we do every week just to still our hearts, to reflect on the weeks that have been and to prepare ourselves to receive our Sunday morning service. So let's pray. Lord, thank you that we are still able to join together as your church this morning to worship you. Thank you for all those watching across our community and across our country, Lord. Thank you for continuing to keep us safe and healthy. But we pray you be with those who aren't safe or aren't healthy, Lord. All those on our hearts that we're worried for. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and you'd put your healing hand upon them, upon our nation during this time. We pray for our service this morning. We pray for the words that we see and hear. And we pray that we would um, receive your blessing and receive your love through what we experience this morning, through the songs that we sing, Lord. We pray for everything in your name. Amen. i 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Oh 
So you see things out and everything you made resounds and all creation standing now singing out your name. We're caught up in the angel's song. We're Today's story is called The Singer. Now this is taken from Matthew chapter 6 and chapter 9 and also from Luke chapter 12. So you can look it up in the Bible. Wherever Jesus went, lots of people went too. They loved being near him. Old people, young people, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Sick people, well people, happy people and sad people and worried people. Lots of them worrying about lots of things. What if we don't have enough food or clothes? Or suppose we run out of money. What if there isn't enough and everything goes wrong and it won't be all right? What then? When Jesus saw all the people, his heart was filled with love for them. They were like a little flock of sheep that didn't have a shepherd to take care of them. So Jesus sat them all down and he talked to them. The people sat quietly on the grassy mountainside and listened. And from where they sat, they could see the blue lake glittering down below them and little fishing boats coming in from a night's catch. The air was fresh and clear. See those birds over there, Jesus said. Everyone looked. Little sparrows were pecking at seeds along the stony path. Where do they get their food? Perhaps they have pantries all stocked up. Cabinets full of food, everyone laughed. Who's ever seen a bird with a bag of groceries? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that because God knows what they need and he feeds them. And what about these wild flowers? Everyone looked around them. They could see flowers growing, anemones, daisies and pure white lilies. Where do they get their lovely clothes? Do they make them? <laughs> Look at them with clothes on. And do they go to work every day so they can buy clothes? Do they have closets full of clothes? Everyone laughed again. Who's ever seen a flower putting on a dress? <laughs> no, Jesus said. They don't worry about that 
because God clothes them in royal robes of splendour. Not even a king is that well dressed. They had never met a king, but as they gazed out over the lake, glittering and sparkling below them, the hillside dressed in reds, purples and golds, they felt a great burden lift from their hearts. They could not imagine anything more beautiful. Little flock, Jesus said, you are more important than the birds, more important than flowers. The birds and the flowers don't sit and worry about things and God doesn't want his children to worry either. God look, loves to look after the birds and the flowers and he loves to look after you too. Jesus knew that God would always love and watch over the world he had made, everything in it, birds, flowers, trees, animals, everything. And most of all, his children. Even though people had forgotten, the birds and the flowers haven't forgotten, they still knew their song. It was the song of all God's creation had sung to him from the very beginning. It was the song people's hearts were made to sing. God made us. He loves us. He is very pleased with us. It was why Jesus had come into the world to sing them that wonderful song. To sing it not only with his voice, but with his whole life so that God's children could remember it and join in and sing it too. Well, what a lovely story that we heard this morning. Um, a really, really lovely story. And me and Cassie, this is Cassie. Um, we just wanted to talk to you a little bit about worries because we all have worries, don't we? And Cassie gets worried sometimes. She gets worried if there's noisy cars or she gets worried if she loses her badger. <laughs> um, and we all have worries and some of our worries are really, really big. And some of our worries are really, really little worries, like if we lose our favourite toy. <laughs> But it doesn't matter how big our worries are or how little our worries are because God wants to know all of them. He wants you to come to him about any of your worries, whether it's that you've lost your favourite toy or whether it's a really big worry. He just wants to listen. Um, and all of our worries seem a little bit less scary and a little bit less worrying when we lift them up and we share them with God. So it's really important that whatever we're worried about, the first thing we do is we turn to God and he will help us um, and he will make us feel a little bit better because God is like our best friend. <laughs> and we're going to do some craft this morning to remind us of that. So I'm going to take you over and do some crafts. So this morning we are going to make a prayer hand. Now you don't need anything you don't need lots and lots of uh, equipment for this one. You just need some coloured paper and you can choose whatever colour you like and you need a pen. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick a favourite colour of paper. And I'm going to go for yellow this morning so that it's really bright and sunny and it matches my jumper. <laughs> and I'm going to put my hand in the middle of the paper like this and I'm going to draw all the way around my hand. Oh, a little bit wobbly. There you can see my hand on the paper. And on each finger of your hand, you're going to write a prayer. So our thumb is the closest finger to us. So we're going to think about all those people close to us and we're going to pray for them. So you can choose and you can write down whoever you like. It could be your grown-ups at home. It could be your sisters or your brothers. It could be your friends or your granny or your granddad. Okay, it can be whoever you like. So I'm going to write down my mummy and daddy. Then we're going to think about the tallest finger in our hand and we're going to pray for those people who lead us. 
um, those people who are in charge. So it could be our head teachers at our school, or it could be the ministers at our church, or it could be the really, oh, <laughs> really big grown-ups who are running our country. And we're going to pray that God brings them wisdom. So you can write down whoever you want, and we're going to pray that God brings them wisdom. I'm going to write wisdom on my tallest finger. And when you've done that, we're going to think about our ring finger. So that's this finger here, what next to your little one. And that is our weakest finger. So we're going to think about um, those who are struggling. So those who aren't doing very well at the moment, um, those who are sick. And there are lots of people who are sick. Um, and we're going to pray for them. So if you've got somebody um, who you want to write down their name specifically, um, you can do that, or you could just write those who are sick. Hello, Cassie. Okay, so I'm going to write everyone who is sick and unwell. The next one we're going to think about is our pointy finger. So this is the finger we use to point at all of the exciting things that we see in the world. And we're going to think about all the people who point the way for us. So thinking about our teachers, our grown-ups, our doctors and people who teach us the right way to live and we're going to pray this morning for them and we're going to pray that God gives them that wisdom and that God helps lead their pointy finger okay so we can write down a teachers and grown-ups and doctors and if you've got someone specific you want to write down if you can think of a favorite teacher you can write them down as well if you want to or you could just be like me I'm just going to write teachers and doctors and grown-ups. Our grown-ups really, not all grown -ups. Okay, I'm going to write down our grown-ups because they're the people who are teaching us the right way to live. And then the last one is our little finger, our tiny little finger. And that one is going to help us to remember our place in relation to God. And God is massive. He's so big. And we are so little, like our little finger. And we're going to think about our relationship to God, because even though we're really little, he still loves us loads and loads. And we're going to think about that today. We're going to think about asking him for forgiveness, asking him to forgive us for things that we've done and we know that he still loves us no matter what. So on our last little finger, we're going to write down forgiveness. And then we're done and we have got our wonderful prayer hand. Now, if I brought some scissors along, I might cut out my prayer hand um, and then you've just got your hand shape and then you can think of somewhere really special to put it so that you can keep remembering all these different things that we're going to pray for. And um, I think I might go and stick it above my bed in my bedroom and then I'll remember before I go to sleep at night. But you can stick it wherever you want to. OK, and we're going to finish with a prayer today. Dear Jesus. Please help us to remember that you love us and we can lift all our worries up to you, no matter if they're big worries or little worries, because you are our loving father and our best friend. Thank you for everything. Amen. Bye, everybody. We've come to the time in our service to take our offering and we're so grateful for all the offerings that you give us every week. For more information about how to give either through the bank details on the screen or through our Just Giving page, just get in touch to find out where your offerings go. So let's pray for those offerings that we receive this morning. Lord. Thank you that we have so much. Thank you that you have given us so much that we are able to give back to further your kingdom through our community and through our country and through our world, Lord. Thank you for everything that we receive this morning through our offerings. And we pray that we would use it wisely and with your love and that we would use it to help those who aren't as fortunate as we are. 
We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. This week's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. One day, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, Why don't your disciples fast like we do, and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not, but some day the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins, so that both are preserved. Well, hello and welcome to another one of Phil's Shed Talks. As you can see, we're in my shed. If you've been with us on this journey, you'll already know what this is all about. If not, don't worry. This is like, you know, when you've missed a couple of episodes of your favourite TV programme, you turn it on and there's like a little bit of a, a reminder, refresher, a bit of a recap. I'm going to quickly do that. So we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We can't attend church the way that we would usually access our spiritual growth system is usually by listening to other people talk, by coming together and actually doing this as a community. But that's not quite so easy at the moment. So we've decided to do an entire sermon series on looking at how do we, you and I, take responsibility for our own spiritual growth. Well, we started off with a key skill that is at the very heart of this, and that is the ability to pull yourself away from the craziness in order to be able to spend time with God. This is probably the greatest skill you can learn as a believer is to be able to pull yourself away for time with God. For example, if you're in a long-term relationship with somebody and you don't carve out special time together, then you begin to grow apart. You can still live in the same house, but grow apart because there's no set time to actually be together. And that's that's crucial. And so if you can understand that in a regular relationship, so too, we need to be able to understand that with our relationship with God. Now, for some of us, this is part of our Sunday, but it has to be more than just a once a week thing. It has to be more than that. So we talked about this. Now, this is skill that is actually called solitude. The choice to be able to pull yourself away from all of the other busy stuff and to say, no, but for this moment, I'm going to spend time with God on my own. And so this is the first one we looked at was solitude. Then we began to look at, well, what do I do in this moment of solitude? And we began to look at meditation. We looked at prayer. And at the moment, we're looking at fasting. Now, if you missed that last week, I really want to encourage you to go back and have a listen to it. One of the major reasons for that is instead of actually talking about how to fast or what to do in a fast or what a fast actually is all about. Last week was purely just taking a look at it from a scriptural perspective and and answering those, you know, major questions. Um, And I'm reminding myself because I don't want to miss out on any of them. But it was essentially like questions, for example, like, Is there any scriptural evidence for fasting? As a believer, should we be fasting? You know, so looking at the Old Testament and we see it was. We then went through and then looked at, you know, did Jesus fast? And we see that, yes, he did. Did he teach on fasting? Yes, he did. Did he command it? No, he didn't. But we'll come to that bit in a minute. Did we see the early believers after Jesus had fasted? fasting uh, after Jesus had died and gone to heaven? Uh, did, did, did we did we see G, uh, the, the disciples then fasting? And the answer to that is an absolute yes, we most certainly did. So that was last week. Now, if you've missed that, I really want to encourage you to do so because I didn't want to wade into this on a, you know, guys, we should be fasting and just jump straight into it. In fact, if I'm honest, 
I don't think I've actually ever heard anybody preach an entire sermon on fasting. I've heard fasting come up in conversation. I've heard fasting come up in a sermon, but never an entire sermon actually on fasting. And I definitely can categorically say I have never heard a series or a a selection of sermons about fasting. So what I'm attempting to do here is actually do something that I've never even seen before. But the more that I read up on this, the more I realise that really this is something that we really should be doing as a church and as a group of individuals. And so that's one of the reasons that we've begun to do this within it. I didn't just want to touch on it, but actually to kind of spend like a decent bit of time looking at it and just to try and remove some of the taboo from it and to try and actually just talk about it for what it is. Now, one of the things I mentioned in this was, did Jesus command fasting? No, what he didn't. No, he didn't. What he did was, I'm really struggling here today. Uh, What he did was actually he taught about fasting in a way that was talking to a group of people that completely understood fasting as part of their regular day-to-day life. So actually, as Jesus is discussing fasting, he's talking to an audience that already gets it. When the New Testament is written, majority of it is written with the assumption that believers understand and already know certain things. Unfortunately, we read this in the 20th century and we're, you know, now the 21st century uh, and we, uh, we we just miss all of these nuances because, well, this is not written to our culture and we don't know half the stuff that we're supposed to already know. So we began to look last week at this idea of fasting. Uh, and like I said, did Jesus say this was a command? No. But what he does do is by talking about it, he says, But when you fast, and we looked at scripturally last week, when you fast, I love that. Which means actually Jesus is under the assumption that actually as believers, you're already going to be fasting. So, but when you do it, do it like this. So what does this mean? It means it's not a commandment. And actually, I'm really glad that it's not a commandment. Because if it was a commandment, therefore I had to do it. Pretty certain I would take no joy out. I'm pretty certain that it would not be a time of blessing for me. But because it was a command that I had to do, I would probably find myself very begrudgingly going, well, if I must, then, you know, let's get on with it. But actually, because it's not a commandment, means that it's a choice that I do. Knowing that actually Jesus thought it was important enough that it should already be part of the spiritual life of an early believer. So therefore, actually, there should be something in this that's going to be a benefit for me. I love this. See how the difference is. It's not a command, but should I? Yes. And if I do, then there's actually something in it. And we're going to begin to look at that this week. So uh, today we're looking at more of the practice side of this, like how do we go about doing this? And we've already heard our Bible reading for today, but our reading is, and I'm just going to go back through it and just actually take a little bit of a look at this, as Jesus was questioned why he's not fasting. He goes through and does a few things. The first one is he actually explains that do wedding guests mourn whilst they're celebrating with the groom? Well, it's an an obvious question. I mean, it it just doesn't almost need answering. So he says, of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away and then they will fast. And we looked at this that we then see in Acts multiple times the various different apostles, you know, which are the disciples here actually then uh, fasting. We see Paul fasting, which would suggest that actually after Jesus leaves, yes, we start to see people choosing to fast. And then he goes on and then uses two other scenarios to kind of help kind of beef out his argument. The first one is he talks about uh, old cloth being patched up with new cloth. Well, as the new cloth is then washed, it shrinks naturally as cloth does. And as it does, it actually makes it worse. And then he goes on and talks about, like, do you put new wine into an old wine skin? Well, as you do and that wine ferments, it's going to cause all sorts of explosions and that's going to be messy. So actually the new is going to destroy the old. And that's what it's kind of talking about here. No, he says, actually, if you're going to do it, then you, you do something different. 
what he's actually talking about here in this section of scripture is he's saying something new is happening. So everything that you thought you knew about it actually is changing. So even when it comes to fasting, it's going to have a different vibe to it. And as we approach, it's going to be different. So this is the same thing. So this is the verse that we're looking at. Now, as we begin to expand and actually look at what fasting is, we're going to be over the next couple of weeks and already you're starting to kind of feel a little fidgety. Phil, please, you're not going to be talking about this next week, are you as well? I am, but don't worry, not about food. We're going to be looking at it in a completely different way next week. But first off, today I want to talk about fasting food and actually why it's even a good idea, or what, what the purpose of it is uh, and, and how we should then go about doing it uh, and what we feel actually perhaps we should be able to achieve through it. Okay, so this is very much a practical talk as opposed to last week, which is very much a theology talk. So uh, I'm going to in this, uh, I'm going to look at the three different fasts that we looked at last time. I'm not sure if you can remember, the first one was the partial. The next one is a normal fast. And the last one is an absolute fast. We're going to be looking at those three things and kind of explaining like, you know, when would be a wise time to do which um, but like I said, next week, we're going to be taking a look at perhaps other things that we can fast. And as we begin to look at this next week, I think we're going to find ourselves also asking, well, what are the areas of our lives can perhaps that we begin to minimalize on, streamline on and the likes. So let's take a look at these three fasts. Well, the first one is a partial fast. Actually, this is a much easier fast. A partial fast we see in Daniel is that he chose to take all the rich foods out, foods that were offered to the temples, he chooses to not fast. We see him just eating vegetables, he's choosing not to drink rich wine, he's actually just going to eat uh, and vegetables and drink water. And as he does this, this is again him kind of setting out a time for him to be able to fast, although not in the fullness, but in a slightly different way. If you are considering fasting, and we're going to look at some of the other parts of fasting in a bit, and, uh, and I want to kind of encourage this. But if you're considering fasting and the idea of suddenly giving up food just feels like a shock horror, then I would encourage perhaps a fa partial fast to be the route. And that would be literally just eating the bare necessities that you need to be able to get through the day. Now, if you are on high dose medication that requires you to be eating, then fasting, full fasting, what we call a normal fast, would be actually not a wise idea. Uh, and I think it would be irresponsible of me to even encourage you to do that. If you're diabetic, for example, uh, and, uh, and so therefore, uh, even without medication, you, you know, the requirement for food, you know, to be able to get your sugar levels in so that you aren't going to be, again, same thing, perhaps a partial fast would be the way to go. And, and in doing so, choosing to eat food that brings you no pleasure. You know, there are certain meals that when we eat, you almost can't help but make noises as you're eating because they're like, oh, this tastes so good. And there are other things you're like, my goodness, this is a task to eat. You know, I'm not enjoying this, but at least it's got the nutrients in it. That's, I would probably argue, is the best type of fast to do. Um, and, and there are ways to be able to do that. You see, the thing is, because this is not a law, because this is not a rule, because Jesus didn't shout, this is a commandment. We've got quite a bit of kind of scope as to how to be able to interpret a fast that works for us. You see, because the purpose of the fast, which we're going to come to in a minute, uh, is the most important aspect. How we go about doing it is quite different. And actually, is I would probably argue, is, is less important. Now, then an absolute fast, so we've gone from a partial now to an absolute, and I'll come to the normal one in a minute. But an absolute fast, this is to not eat food or drink fluids. Uh, we see this used on several points during uh, the historical side of the Old Testament as there are major issues and people and there's a call for, for, for prayer and for fasting. And this is usually because it's on a state level, like a state emergency, like something shocking is happening and we're calling our people to fast. And that is to eat, neither eat, food nor drink water. Now, the doctors among us are automatically going, Phil, I'm a little bit un unsure about, you know, how wise it is to preach this. Again, 
the human body cannot go beyond three days without water. So to do an absolute fast for beyond three days is essentially me warranting a death for my church. And that's not what I'm suggesting. But there is definitely a time when that would be the right response. But again, for a particular time period and no more. So that's your partial. And now we've just talked about the absolute. Now let's look at a normal fast. Uh, a normal fast, when people usually talk about fasting, actually they're talking about normal. This is the most common form of fasting. And this means to choose to go without food for a chosen period of time. And it might be that you're choosing to give up, you know, lunch. And instead of having lunch, I'm going to choose to spend some time in prayer and fasting and seeking God. It could be that you choose to do it for a full 24 hours. It could be that you choose to do this for a full seven days. Jesus did it for 40 days, only drinking water. I have many friends who have done a 40 day fast. So this is when people talk about fasting, this is usually what they're talking about. It's this idea of saying, actually, I'm not going to eat for X amount of time. Now then, um, the, the first question is, let's start to now look. So we're, now we've established what a fast actually is. And, and from here on out, when you hear me talk about fasting, I'm pretty much going to be talking about a normal fast. Uh, and if you're on this journey and there's dietary requirements or medical requirements, and you'd still like to join us on this, uh, on this as a journey, then perhaps I would suggest the partial fast. Um, and, uh, and, and you can decide and decipher what that's going to look like for you. Um, but like I said, there's no set in stone. This is the way that it must be. So the first thing is, what's the point of a fast? Like, what, what are we hoping to achieve? Like, what, what, are we, what are we aiming for through this? Well, the first one is really obvious, actually. And that it is, I'm desiring a closeness with God. And, and that's really the whole reason for this, is I'm choosing to say that actually my relationship with God comes first. I'm taking, making this a priority. I'm going to choose the pursuit of God to be a priority. And actually for, you know, maybe it's for a day, maybe it's for 12 hours, maybe it's for a bit longer. And I'm actually just going to say, do you know what, God, I, I'd so long to meet you, to know you, to be closer to you, and actually choosing to pursue God through that. The second one is a sense of like, you know, a sense of, of, of special relationship with God. There's something special about this. Is I've actually chosen to not eat for this period of time. And actually, I, I'm saying to God that, that you are more important. So the second thing is it kind of like, it, it just makes the day special in my pursuit of God. And then again, I'd probably argue that it's, again, it's to be close to God. I mean, this it has to be at every level. Yes, I think it does help us, like, become more mentally sharp as I'm choosing to, to kind of, like, not focus on the other things, not focus on food, not focus on, on, on where my next meal's coming from, but actually I'm choosing to focus on God. And yes, actually, I would absolutely agree. Whilst you're uh, fasting, you should expect to kind of feel a mental sharpening as you go through this and with that a clarity of prayer so my four kind of reasons that i would suggest as we go through praying is that that we should expect you know as we do this a closeness of god that we should feel that it's special because it's about the closeness of god we should expect to feel that our, our, our mental aspect and how we speak to God and how we listen to God is sharpened and heightened as we grow closer to God and that we should feel that in the way that we pray that there's an element of clarity to it as we grow closer to God. Do you see something almost like sticking there as we grow closer to God in amongst all of it? It has to be absolutely entwined because that's what it's all about. Now then I would say that there are several side effects that you will notice uh, through fasting. Now the first one is obvious. The side effect that you notice whilst fasting is that you're hungry. But actually I find that the days that I fast, and I'm going to come to explaining a little bit more because 
I am going to actually talk about like fasting from my perspective. And, and I know the verse that we looked at last week kind of talks about like when you fast and pray, do it in a way that nobody notices. But in order for me as your minister to set an example to actually talk about this, I will actually talk about like what it's like when I fast and how and why I fast. We'll come to that in a minute. But one of the things that I notice is that actually my hunger, it can be utterly unbearable on non-fast days. Like, I'm like sitting there, my stomach growls, and I'm like, I am so hungry. But on a fast day, what's interesting is I find that my stomach rumbles. And instead of actually having that as a, like, it's just an unbearable pain. Actually, I'm just, it's like, I'm aware that my stomach's rumbling. I'm aware that I'm hungry. But that in itself is almost like an alarm just to remind me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Many of us have got smartphones. Some of you will be watching this service on your smartphone. Our smartphones are designed in a way to be able to grab our attention, are they not? When I get a text message or a WhatsApp message or BBC News, whatever that notification is, that notification shows itself in one of two ways. My phone is set up so that it makes a sound um, and each notification has got its own tone to it. And then also it's set to vibrate. And when I stick it onto silent, it only vibrates. So if I'm sat and there's a sudden tone, I actually know more often than not what that tone symbolizes. Even within WhatsApp, for example, my wife has got her own text tone. So I know that when a certain tone goes off, that is a notification to say, Phil, my wife's trying to get in touch which honestly means it's a higher priority than when it's one of the other texts or one of the other notifications. When it's BBC News, I'm probably not gonna run and pick up the phone to see what it's about. But if it's my wife that's messaging, I'm more than likely to pick up the phone and see what she's asking. So that's that one. But if it's in my pocket and it's on silent, and my phone vibrates, it tells me that I have a notification. Now, normally if it's on silent, it's usually on silent because I'm in a meeting or I'm speaking to somebody or whoever it is has got a higher priority than what's going on in my pocket, but I can still feel it vibrating. And there is a reminder that at some point in the future, I'm gonna to need to get out and have a look at and see what it's about. But everything within me is telling me that I need to not get it out of my pocket right now and have a look at it because the person I'm with is of a higher priority. Sometimes I'm not great at that, but that's how it's supposed to work in principle. On a fast day, I choose to think about my stomach's noise or its crazy vibrations as being a reminder of something. It's a notification to say, I'm hungry. Why am I hungry? Well, I'm hungry because I'm fasting. Why am I fasting? Because I'm actually choosing to dedicate this day to God. So that notification does what? It prompts me to pray. It prompts me to press into God. It prompts me to say, I want more of God. So I would say that my notification it's almost like it's on silent because I'm choosing not to do anything with whatever that is right now. I'm not going to deal with that, but it's just a reminder that actually I'm here to spend time with God. My desire is to grow close to God. My desire is to pray for those things that's on my list of things, the people that I'm praying for, whether it's for the salvation of, whether it's for our church to grow, whether it's for such and such who's ill at the moment, whatever that is. So for me, the reminder is a reminder of just that, that I, not that I need to eat, but instead that I need to push in to God. What else do we find? Well, I start to wonder actually, you know, because once you get into a routine of fasting, so that it's, you know, the first time you do it, it's, <laughs> it's gonna be difficult, not gonna lie. I'm not even gonna pretend that you're gonna love it. I think you probably would. But if you're able to build up some sort of a routine that you fast re regularly or semi-regularly, I think what you'll notice is that actually you, on the days that you're not fasting, you, when you suddenly feel, oh, I'm so uncontrollably hungry, you'll go, 
well, I was successful it managed to do X amount of time, 24 hours, 12 hours, six hours. I've managed to do seven days, whatever it is. Well, if I was able to do that, so I haven't eaten since breakfast, it's not the end of the world. I'm not going to die. My stomach's just been grumpy. Then it makes me begin to realize that actually, as a secondary, that I wonder what other areas of my life were always the forefront and now perhaps shouldn't be. So for example, on a normal day, I'm hungry. And so that almost dictates, I'm already thinking about what my next meal is gonna be. I'm starting to wonder, do I have X amount in? Am I gonna to have to go to the shops? And it's, I'm no longer thinking about whatever I'm doing. I'm now thinking about food. But now as I'm beginning to grasp a hold of, it's not in control, <laughs> I'm in control. Then takes me on to another level where I start to wonder, well, what other areas of my life actually have got that same level? I've talked about smartphones and notifications. It does make you wonder, you know, are there other areas of my life that actually I place on a higher priority level than maybe spending time with God? What is the master? Is my phone the master or am I the master of my phone? It's that TV program. Is it the scrolling through Facebook? Is it the news at whatever time it is? Like, does that hold more priority in your life than loved ones? Does that hold more priority in your life than your relationship with God? You can see where that kind of thought process, and I'm going to look at that a little bit more next week in a bit more depth. But uh, it does start to wonder, you know, is there areas I perhaps dis detox from distractions? Now, okay, let's just talk through like uh, my examples of, of fasting. And I just want to share with you now, I never really shout about this, uh, but since starting in ministry uh, for pretty much the last three years, uh, I fasted every Wednesday. Um, and the question for that, like why, why am I fasting? Well, I first stumbled across fasting with uh, one of my... Uh, Kenyan friends, a guy called Luke. I remember we were uh, co-running uh, a youth church up in Liverpool called the Late Night Service and we just were beginning to see the church grow. Uh, we had a, a group of about 20-ish teenagers uh, and bit by bit we were starting to find that we're getting more and more kids coming to this and more and more students coming along and people in their early 20s to this. And it was a really exciting time. But what we wanted to make sure that we were centred on who God was, that God was more important than the growth. But at the same time that we wanted to be able to manage the growth with wisdom. And we were praying about it. And Luke said, I think we should fast. I'm going to fast this Monday. Would you join me? And I just remember feeling utterly repulsed by the idea, like, do you know how hangry I get? You don't want me like that for a day. But you know what? I gave it a bash. I remember going into work and uh, and trying to get through my work day. And, you know, I, I chose to still drink tea and coffee. But, you know, and people were passing the biscuits around and I'm like, you know, let's not talk about that I'm fasting. But like, I really don't want a biscuit, but I really do want a biscuit. And it comes to lunchtime and everyone goes upstairs and they're having their lunch and I just chose to go out for a walk and to pray. And I certainly found was as I was walking and praying that it, it became more special than me just going out for a, a walk and a pray because I was hungry. I was choosing to give up food in order to be able to spend time with God. And actually, I remember feeling a real breakthrough. And then when it finally came time to be able to break that fast, that actually that first meal felt so special. And I remember just that immense sense of gratitude. Oh God, I love this food. Thank you as I'm eating, because I'm legitimately hungry. Well, that then kind of caused me to think, I should probably do this more frequently. And so Luke and I then began to fast each week. And what we began to see was that that church then began to grow in an incredible way. When I left Liverpool to, to move uh, uh, down to the, the, the West Midlands, we had around about 100 teenagers and uh, students and young adults coming along to our services. Uh, and there was just a real deep sense of the presence of God in meetings. And it was wonderful. 
And I'm so blessed to see so many of those uh, young people that were then that are now like, you know, um, you know, fully fledged adults just really going on for God. And it's wonderful. And I genuinely believe that prayer and fasting walking hand in hand and doing it alongside somebody else was an incredible breakthrough for me, but also a breakthrough in the spiritual. So then coming into ministry, feeling hugely underqualified to do the job that's in front of me. And, and I'm, you know, three and a bit years into this now. In fact, actually, I'm coming up on, on four years into this. Uh, and I would like to say that I am still as underqualified as I was. I still feel that, you know, that this is just a massive task uh, and it's a huge burden. It, good burden, but a sense of like, you know, Lord, I really don't want to mess this up. And so I have chosen to, on a Wednesday, to fast. And to fast because actually I long for a deeper sense of wisdom. I long for a growth in my own spiritual life. I long that my own spiritual life will be something that others would be able to see and go. The way that Phil does, faith is great. Like, I want to be able to live in that example, just as Paul says to his early church, do as I do. Like, if we as, as a leadership team have to be setting an example and saying, live as we live. And that's easier said than done. And I feel hugely underqualified to be able to do that. So for me to fast and pray is part of me just setting aside day and saying, Lord, this is for you. And I long to be more like you. And there is times during that that I've not got into that routine. I have to say that actually since going into lockdown, uh, that the whole sudden change to the way that my daily calendar looked, it was really easy for me to put fasting over to one side. It talks about when fasting, we looked at this last week in Matthew chapter 6, talks about when you fast, to comb your hair, to, uh, you know, to, to dress well, to not make people think that there's something unusual so that you aren't singing and dancing and dancing, hey guys, look how awesome I am, I'm fasting. And but there's been times that I, I've gone to go and visit people in their homes on a Wednesday and that I've been invited to stay for lunch. And I know that if I was to say, I can't because I'm fasting, I actually would upset that person because they really hoped that I would stay. Now, what's more important, that I religiously do my fast or that I choose to not cause offence? And so there's been times when actually I would honestly say that I've chosen to break my fast much earlier than anticipated because actually uh, I'm going to sit down and eat with this person. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, I, I believe that that's the right choice to do. You see, imagine if I, you know, publicly declared, I'm, I, I do tell people how blessed I am to have an incredible life that I have. But imagine if I stood in front of everybody and said, I just want everyone to know just how much I love my wife. And just went on and on about how great she is and how wonderful she is. And then kind of talked about, aren't you all just so impressed with how much I love my wife? Well, you see, but the more that I go down that route, the more that Nick will eventually just sit there and go, babe, that wasn't actually about me at all, was it? That was just so that people would be so impressed with how much you love me. Would that make her feel more special or not? Well, she would just feel like, actually, all the praise you're getting from everybody else is the only praise you deserve or that you really need because, you know, I know that you love me. See, the thing is, actually, we've got to be really careful that when we fast, we don't go around like singing about how great we are for the fact that we're fasting. Because God's not interested in that. Actually, he just longs for you to have time with him. And let's face it, as we've already looked at, what is the major reason for fasting? Because actually, I want to have a closeness with God. So for me, you know, a desire, that's one of the major reasons that I fast. And I tend to fast uh, where... I'll have a meal on the Tuesday evening and then I won't have anything for breakfast. I won't have anything for my lunch and then I will break my fast in the evening in order to allow me to be able to sit down and have a meal with Nick because we kind of prioritise our evening meals. Um, there are times when I feel actually that perhaps I should do a little bit longer. Um, I have done fasts that have been longer than that. Um, I remember doing a seven day fast when I was 18 
But I might add, it was not because of a desire for closeness of God. I did it because everybody knew how much I liked food and I was going on mission to Africa and I needed to raise some money. So I basically said, guys, if I don't eat for a full seven days, will you sponsor me? And of course, everybody gave, pledged to give silly money because they thought there was no way Phil could do seven days. But I did. I did a full seven days. <laughs> and then all these bitter people had to actually pay up because I'd kept my end of the agreement. Now, uh, I might add, if you choose to do a longer fast, there are some uh, experiences that you should expect. Uh, and, uh, and some of those will be that it's, you know, the, the first couple of days will be really difficult. And then it starts to get a little bit easier. Then you cease to feel um, some of those kind of hunger pains with the same level. And actually, you kind of find yourself in this much easier level. It's not actually, and I believe that I've not actually got this far, but for those that do 40 days, it's usually after about 20 days or so that you literally start to feel hunger. And that literally is that your body is starting to now uh, use, uh, use up its food storage. And that's where you begin to properly move into starvation. And again, if you're going to do a long one, you know, I recommend that you come alongside somebody else and that you, you know, you talk and pray about it and that you remain in, in, in this. If it gets to a point where you're starting to get ill, like stop, for goodness sake. Right. You know, there are longer fasts that does make sense, but it's got to be for the right reasons. And actually, as we finish this, because I am ending now, what I would say is the most important thing about fasting at all is that you do it for the right reason. And then that reason is that actually you wish for a closeness with God. Because if it's for any other reason, if it's for a clever way to lose weight, that's not fasting. That's just starving yourself in order to be able to lose weight. If you're thinking about doing it so that everybody would know how great you are, that's not fasting. That's just showing off. But, you know, I would love for us to get to a point as a church community where we say, actually, we're going to pray for something specific and we're going to call a church fast. And for those that can to fast with us, it would be great if we could uh, within your micro communities, maybe suggest, you know, getting together and saying, actually, let's pray for something specific and actually let's fast together for those that can. You see, I think. This is a discipline that's supposed to be something that will bring life. And so actually, we need as a church to begin to start thinking and talking about this in exactly the same way we would talk about praying. Notice that Jesus goes straight from prayer straight into fast like it was so normal. Yet to us, we go praying and we go, what? I've had some wonderful conversations this week with individuals who were just shocked and surprised to see that fasting is even part of the Christian belief system. Like, you know, we see our brothers in, you know, whatever faith system, you know, Islam or whatever, where they're fasting, you know, but actually the surprise that many, that actually fasting is something that is considered normal in Christianity because it's not talked about so we're opening a dialogue when we're talking about this and i would like to encourage you to consider fasting like i said maybe you don't necessarily start with something really heavy lower yourself into it if you'd like some more information on this i want to encourage you to get in contact uh, with me you can find me on facebook um and just uh you know just to kind of begin a dialogue let's talk about this uh, and uh, maybe within, if you're part of our church and part of our micro communities, you know, maybe discuss this and talk about this in your group. But this is something that's supposed to help sharpen your relationship with God. And I think this is a wise thing for us to begin to not just think about, but actually do. Shall we close in prayer? Let's do it. Heavenly Father, as we just come to you now, we've talked about this idea of giving up food and uh, just for a period of time to fast because, Lord, I have a desire to know you more. Lord, my hope, my prayer is for people this week is that actually, as we begin to think about this, Lord, that there will be some who would choose to take that leap of faith 
And Lord, in doing so, would experience a newness with you in a way that they could never have imagined. Lord, I thank you that the Christian faith is so multifaceted. Lord, I thank you that you long to meet with us in so many new and unique ways. Lord, I pray that you would take us from the comfort zones that we're in, push us into the unknown, and Lord, that we may thrive. So God, be with us in this up and coming week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
And we've reached the end of our service. Thank you so much for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching it to worship together. We hope you've enjoyed the message that you've heard and we hope that it will stay with you throughout the rest of the week. Just a reminder that if you want to stick around after the service, if you're watching it on Sunday morning, we will have our usual Zoom social call afterwards. Um, the details for this will be in the comments of the Facebook video. This is just a chance to either get to know some of the faces that you've seen on screen if you haven't joined us before or to catch up with some old friends if you have and we invite you to come along to that so let's pray for our weeks ahead and for everything that we've heard this morning lord thank you thank you that we can still worship you though we are separated across our family we are still joined together to worship you this morning. We pray for everything that we've heard. We pray that we would um, remember it as we go through our weeks and we pray that through our weeks you would continue to keep us safe and you would be with those who are struggling, who are feeling more separated than others Lord and we pray that you would continue to help those who are trying to help those feeling isolated. We pray for health and for safety for our family and for our nation lord as we begin to move through this time and move out of this time lord and see a light at the end of this time and we pray for everything in your name lord amen <laughs>